And we are live once again. Ladies and gentlemen, tech entrepreneurs, tech founders, tech executives all around the world, and especially in Asia, welcome to episode 12 of the Epicenter. And um, today I have a, a super special guest, someone that I normally call boss, but today my guest on episode 12 Oren, what's up? What's up? Hey, what's up? How are you? What's up? What's up? I'm great. How are you today? Very good. Very good. Uh, busy morning as usual. And it's nothing better than to start uh, noon and afternoon than uh, chatting with you on it. So thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we have a, a very diverse global audience here, but Particularly, like uh, we we get to get a lot of exposure in Asia, and a lot of people probably unfamiliar with the humble background and and also your humble beginnings, like how you came up with Apps Flyer. I remember I remember you had mentioned like something about buying your first iPhone, and how how did that jumpstart you co-founding this now multi-billion-dollar company? Yeah, so. Uh, I think that, you know, uh, this is kind of another overnight success that took us a lot, many, many, many years uh, in the work. But maybe just in a natural, my my personal background is software engineering. Uh, so in th I think that this is something that I'm taking with myself through all my career and thinking in logical way and what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. Um, um, in 2010, uh, I was fortunate enough to have an exchange program from the university. I was doing an MBA uh, to Wharton in the East Coast in the U.S. And there I got my first iPhone, a used iPhone that I got on Craigslist. Uh, I was using BlackBerry and I was sure that BlackBerry is the thing. I didn't think that Apple can build anything that can compete BlackBerry. Uh, it just didn't make sense to me. Obviously, I was completely wrong. Um, and, and the first day I got my first iPhone, again, and that was used iPhone, um, I couldn't go to sleep. I was sure that this device was, is going to change everything. In the first 24 hours, um, I thought that this device is going to change everything about every aspect in our lives. And I really wanted to build something that is around this uh, device. I also was fortunate enough to have a summer internship in one of the VCs in the city. Uh, and then I noticed that app developers cannot measure anything. Uh, they don't know where the users are coming from. Uh, they're making marketing significant, sometimes significant marketing decisions uh, without really knowing the numbers or the data and stuff like that. And, and I, not coming from the marketing, not coming from the advertising industry, it just doesn't make sense to me. How come you're making decisions without getting the feedback loop? How, how do you learn from your, from your actions? I mean, just what? You spray and pray? Um, and I thought that this is going to be extremely interesting technology to solve because I thought that this is someone must solve it. It must be solved. And I thought that this is a really interesting thing uh, uh, to solve. I also got, as, as a VC, you do a research around the ecosystem. Uh, I'm sure that you, some of you maybe remember the Luma slide of the marketing and tech companies. I looked at it and I'm, it just didn't make sense to me. Uh, so many companies, conflicting interests. Uh, if you are optimizing a campaign, are you optimizing buy side, sell side? Um, and there is a good conflict of interest with buyers and sellers, right? So buyers want right. to pay less and get more. And sellers want to get more and do less. This is nature and that's okay. Uh, but I couldn't find any technology or a company that really and truly represent the buyers in this ecosystem. Um, um, and we thought, okay, we don't know much. We know that companies need to measure their decisions in, in decision-making process. And we also thought this is a huge market and there's buyers have to have someone to represent their interests. Um, so at the beginning, we didn't really know what we're doing, uh, but we thought, okay, this is this is kind of the logical aspect of doing it. Um, in the first one, two, almost two years, people didn't get that. Investors didn't get that. No one wanted to give us money. Um, 
And we've been focusing on really building the technology and the product to serve our customers. So the customers will find value. Um, um, and we kind of said, okay, no one wants to give us money. So let's focus on, on delivering value to customers because this is what we need to do anyways. And if we will be successful in doing so, uh, everything else will follow. And I think that this is kind of, it planted the seed of our customer obsessed mindset. Um, because we didn't know marketing and advertising and advertising. And if we thought, okay, if we're going to be very close to our customers, um, really and truly understand their challenges, current challenges and future challenges, then we can learn what we need to build in order to satisfy their challenges today and in the future. And I think that this is what we took, you know, nine, nine and a half years after as kind of the core mindset of the company and the source of our customer obsessed mindset. So I can tell you just back to the question, um, back in 2010, 11 and 12, I didn't, I didn't work for almost three years. I was completely broke. Uh, so it, I, I had like, uh, really, I, I, I took all my savings. So I, I was completely uh, broke, but on the other end, I, I was really happy. I was following my passion. I, I enjoyed and I, I, I also didn't spend a lot. So I didn't really need a lot of money just to live. It was rent and that's it. Uh, so. Right. Well, well, actually one of my, uh, one of my favorite uh, pictures is of you and uh, Apsar's other co-founder, Reshef, when you guys are sitting there in the library and uh, just being entered into the Microsoft uh, Accelerator program. And you have your laptop right which is the newest uh the newest uh macbook but it's actually not it's a thinkpad and you put a, a an apple sticker on there because you knew that you wanted to be cool but <laughs> let's talk about let's talk about being cool because in in our company slack you have the title of it manager right and look it's damn cool to be a like to have this engineering dna and the CEO combined into one, right? Take us through like how this how this background of being an engineer and a co-founder of a company helps you captain this rocket ship. Yeah. So m maybe first of all, uh, I think that I have this logical mindset, and things th need to make sense. And one of the saying that uh, I learned through the years that common sense is not that common. And we need to learn that common sense is not that common. And you need to force that. You need to really uh, uh, make your team think as common sense. Okay, why you make that decision, et cetera. Um, IT manager. So yeah, that, that's kind of my unofficial official title in inside the company. Uh, because first of all, this is how I started. Uh, and then in terms of problem safe, uh, uh, solving, really doing things, a lot of things in my hands. Um, if you go into our ticketing, support ticketing system, if you go a couple of years back, you'll find my tickets. Um, and I think the tickets, uh, support tickets is amazing because this is kind of where the market tell you what they think about your product. So you've been working on this and this and that. And the form of, of, of support tickets is amazing because usually they don't file a ticket and tell you, hey, your product is amazing. Uh, we just want to tell you how much we love your team and stuff like that. So usually uh, they tell you what's wrong with your product. And this, this is great because you can learn. So I was, I was really uh, into that. Um, and also why still I'm, I'm keeping that title? Oh, and, and back then we didn't really have IT. So on the internet infrastructure network, and also installing computers, uh, laptops for, for for new employees. I was always I always had like new laptop and boxes like installing next to me, you know, next 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 and stuff like that. So I was kind of doing that. Um, but I also see myself today as one thousand employees. I serve my people. I need to make sure that they have the right tools and culture and infrastructure so they can do a great job. So my job is to enable other people to do to do a great job. And it's it's not my job to tell them what to do. It's just to enable them in decision-making, how we're making decision, and not exactly the what, but providing them with this culture and infrastructure and, 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 and doing what they do. And I think that this is a big part of uh, IT manager. So I think that IT manager is better 
describing my job today also. Well, and you provide, it sounds like it's a great uh, framework that you provide to the people around you to enable them to succeed. And like an IT manager, it's giving the best tools that uh, people around you need to be able to do their job more efficiently, right? And yep. you, just, you just mentioned something uh, uh, that the company has crossed 1,000 employees. Not only that, it opened the 19th office uh, just uh, last month in Sydney, Australia. If any Aussies out there, good eye, mate. So, um, like now with this big workforce, and you're almost 10 years into this company, what was what was this focal point that you realized? Hey, we're actually building something that is much bigger than we thought that we were building. Take mm -hmm. us through that moment or that 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 aha that you had. Yeah. So you know. It's really interesting because at the beginning, we didn't really think that this is what's going to happen. Uh, we've been looking to survive through the next quarter or the next year. I remember, you know, at the beginning, obviously, when we didn't have any funding, so it's like really scary. You don't know if this is what you're going to be doing in the next couple of months. It's really scary. And, and also, when we got the initial funding, it was very little. So uh, we had this Excel file. I had this, uh, this Excel file was only for me and and time to leave and how much money we have left uh, before we need to, to tell everybody hey we i'm sorry we cannot pay salaries and uh, and stuff like that so it was then it was five months four months three months we got even to two and a half months uh time to leave it was a really interesting time so i don't think that there was a kind of a, a big aha moment i think that our reality kind of expanded um and 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 also, I think that now I'm I'm, I'm thinking about uh, Shimon Shimon Peres book and and quote and no room for small dreams. So we didn't really we didn't dare to even dream that this is going to be our reality a few years after. And I quit, and I ask myself, should have we dreamt bigger? Maybe yes, maybe no. I re I don't really know. But what I do know is that the dreams are in the magnitude of your reality. So if, 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 you, if you don't have, let's say, money to feed your children or pay rent, obviously the dream is that you will have enough money to pay rent and, and, and give food your, to your children and, and family. Uh, this mm -hmm. is the biggest dream. But once you have that, you have other stuff. And, and I think that you need to kind of fulfill your basic needs so you can really dream big. Um, so now it's really easier for us to think and dream bigger um because we can see further and our reality is is different but uh i i really go with the no room for small dreams and i think that if i ask myself should have we dream bigger when we started the company in the first two years the first three years so i i would say definitely yes um and and i think that you need to kind of take in in this journey take people that can, visionary people that can help you uh, th see further because there are so many challenges along the way. I think that one of the stories that really helped us figure out that we are onto something big is one of the first customers that we had. It was a ride-sharing uh, app. Uh, they had a campaign in, in the UK. Um, um, and attribution didn't really exist so they've been working with an ad network only on clicks and impressions and we told them hey take this attribution link provide that to the ad network um and they started to work with that they saw a bunch of clicks and impressions everything was good but as as soon as they look at the, the absolute dashboard they saw zero zero installs ah, impressions clicks ah, all good everything is good absolute zero nothing uh, obviously, the network was pissed off. What is this app flyer thing? This is it doesn't work. Uh, so I told Reshef, my CTO, look, maybe there you have a bug. It, it doesn't count anything. And there is only one install. And uh, actually, this is the network that was testing this out. So he looked into data, into the data, and we were shocked. We were shocked because we saw traffic. Uh, it was a UK campaign, so the service existed only in the UK App Store. 
We saw traffic from all over the place. We saw traffic from Indonesia, from Asia. We saw it was an iOS app. We saw traffic from Android. Android. So actually, I think that this is when we realize that if you're buying impressions, this is what you're going to get. And if you're buying clicks, this is what you're going to get. And you know what? If you're buying installs, this is what you're going to get. But once you measure value, and value for me is that someone installed the app and used it, this is value. And if you can measure that, this is what you're going to get. So I think that this is what kind of uh, the real realization uh, that we are onto something huge because it wasn't about fraud. This is how the industry used to work. Hey, you all want clicks? I give, I give you clicks. You buy clicks, this is what, you, what you're going to get. And I think that this is kind of a very early on the realization that, hey, this is, this is huge and there's so much value and we need to continue to evolve this platform. Uh, but along the way, there are a lot of aha moments. I think that this is kind of the, for me, the way I felt after this uh, kind of uh, incident is like, whoa, this is, uh, we need to move faster. If this is what's going on in the world, uh, we have a lot of uh, companies to save, really. Save. Uh, absolutely. And, and save many uh, apps flyer has, right? And uh, this is, uh, this is kind of the, the aha that propelled the company to where it is today. Um, something interesting, and I think this is probably more getting into the subject of, of you know, what, what some of the audience might be looking to hear is like, how would you assess the state of the current marketing tech stack? Like, is it cluttered? Like, in hindsight, do you think that the, that, that the general stack was actually prepared for the challenges that, you know, have been brought forth by the pandemic? And, you know, we'll talk about uh, Apple as well after this, too. Yeah. So, so I think that when you're talking about marketing stack, it's very different than the West and the East. I think it's very different than uh, uh, mobile first, mobile only companies and services and the rest of, of, the, of the world. I think that if you're looking at the U.S., it's really complex. So they have the web, they have legacy, they have code of 20 years, of different vendors, homegrown. Uh, desktop, email, it's really, really complex. And they didn't really invest in mobile because they, the adoption of what they can do with mobile was kind of really late, a couple of years late after after uh, Asia. Uh, and still there is a gap. Um, I think that pretty big gap. Um, that's, that's on kind of the West and the US. But if you're looking at Asia, uh, it's much more simpler, much more advanced in mobile. And what what people can do with mobile, what companies can do with mobile devices. So if you think about, um, well, I remember one of the research that we had, we measured lifetime value per device and how much money uh, um, is, is going through a device in the U.S. and Asia. And we found that Asia and the U.S. and the West is almost identical. And, well, in, in, in first Side, it doesn't make sense because if you think about GDP and uh, not GDP, uh, GP, GDP uh, per capita, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. But if you're thinking about the U.S., that many people have so many credit cards and uh, desktop and laptop and this and that, and they do so many things out outside their mobile devices, and they are really uh, are not using that. And, and in Asia. Uh, there is a lot of activity in payments and stuff like that. Everything is being done mobile device, so it did make sense. Um, and and I think that the tech the tech stack on the mobile side is much more advanced in Asia um, uh, than in the US. I think that also the vendors didn't really uh, uh, develop uh, uh, platforms for 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 mobile. Uh, in the U.S., if you're looking at the major marketing clouds, uh, I think that they're way behind in terms of uh, connecting all the dots together in mobile. Uh, on the other end, and I think that this is important to note, and especially that we are, we are talking with people uh, and audience from Asia, I think that the U.S. and also Europe leading on the privacy, that's Europe, and security in, in, in the U.S. And I think that this is where uh, Asia... Uh, in general, lagging in terms of security practices, uh, uh, security practices, and 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 and, and uh, privacy practices. So the way we operate is, we take all these kind of uh, 
great things that we see in the US and Europe in terms of privacy and security, apply that into the into the platform and deliver that to Asia. And we 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 see ourselves as educating the market. Hey, before you onboard such a platform, this is what you need to do, and this is the, th the important things in terms of security and privacy. So uh, we see that part of our mission, because um, I think that this is extremely important. I think that this region is is behind for sure. I, I know that. Um, but on the other end, we see a lot of innovation in Asia in mobile. We apply that into the into the platform and deliver that to customers all over the world. So I think that this is kind of everybody win uh, kind of a platform. <laughs> Uh, because we learn different things and we apply that into the platform back. So I think that this kind of advantage of really, truly being global company uh, adds significant value to everybody. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, I, I, I love what you're saying because obviously me being here in Asia and, and living here in Asia my whole life, um, I'm, I'm less representative of the, of the current generation because these are people that have grown up with a mobile only, right? not even experiencing uh, desktop and, and you know how many billions of people who their only connectivity to the outside world is through this uh, through this device so I think it, it's it's significant and, and this is a, a good like segue to like 2021 is is around the corner right well there's there's a lot of things that happened this year um, in the industry and what major shifts do you think are going to happen? Obviously, we, we, we see even a question in uh, about IDFA. Um, is the pandemic going to continue? What what you know? How do you think the in, this industry is going to be? Uh, you know, for next year yeah. and the, and for the foreseeable future. So so I think that this is a great question. This is a question that we all need to ask ourselves uh, in life, personal life, and business. Uh, we've been asking these these questions ourselves a couple of years back, and this is how we came up with our four pillars. So our four pillars, one of them is security and privacy. So we, we identified security and privacy is something that is important today, will continue to be important in the future. So if you're looking at 2025, 2030, I don't think that security is not going to be important. I think that it's going to be more important. Privacy, it's going to be more important. So uh, we've been investing in these areas, and I think that every business needs to ask themselves, uh, themselves what is the invariance, things that never going to change in terms of their business and while well, everything else will change because there are a lot of uh, rapid change around us. Some of them uh, that you can predict, most of them you cannot predict. Uh, but the invariance, the thing that you decide that the customers, no matter what, in 2025 and 2030, it's still going to be important for them. These are the things that you need to be, to, to be best, to be the best at. Um, and, and again, we identified pre-security privacy. We wanted to be the best in that. And this is what we've been doing in the last couple of years. So this privacy changes. I think that this dramatic changes that Apple is proposing. Um, uh, but in terms of the company and our customers and partners, I think that we've been, I think, the, very ready to these kind of changes uh, because we've been investing in this uh, all these years. And, and you know, you have to have also long-term mindset because uh, the benefit of investing in these environments, things that never can change, are very long-term. But once uh, once you hit that kind of long-term, I think it pays off. Um, I think that if we if we are looking at 2021, I don't think that Corona is going to go anywhere. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as a company, we we operate as uh, in the mindset that it's going to be around for the next two years. Uh, it means uh, for us in terms of the business, what kind of product do we need to have? So uh, when cor Corona hit it, we introduced free packages. So customers that don't have budget can use and still use our technology in terms of own media and engaging products for free. That's one. Second thing is we created a package uh, that really dedicated to Corona that people can not only uh, we work from home, but our customers work from home. So what do we need to what do we need to deliver them so they can do their job using the Apple platform from home? So we invested in the app and, and alerts and comparing different time frames and, and comparing that uh, with COVID-19 period. Um, so again, uh, predicting into the future, I think that the best way uh, for us is to go back to our four pillars, security and privacy, enabling innovation, data accuracy, because people are depending on our data and focusing on customers. I think that uh, every company should identify the four pillars and focusing on that, con 
privacy and industry changes will continue to be in 2021 and in the future. It's not going to stop. Uh, it's, it's, it's going to continue. Uh, remote workforce, remote uh, work from home, stuff like that. More uh, companies need to realize that this is the future and how they can innovate on top of it. How can they can build cultures, great cultures and work environment uh, where people are working from remote, onboarding from remote. It's, it's, it's not an easy task. And if it's a small company, it's even harder. If it's a big, really big company, it's really, really hard. I think that for us, this is kind of a sweet spot that we are not too big, not too small. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I think that, uh, yeah, it's a big challenge yeah. anyways. Yeah, and and, and uh, I think that there's, like, let, let's kind of shift very quickly um, to giving back, right? I think this is something that all companies have to do. But in Apps Flyer, I mean, you've pledged 1% of resources to give back. The $500,000 COVID fund that was, you know, uh, done, there's... Um, early on, like in February, we were sending masks to China, um, zero budget marketing. I mean, there's so many things, so many initiatives, like, like, tell us about giving back. Like, why has this become such a critical part of, of the AppSolar success story? Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks for, uh, mentioning it. I think that this, it has to the, first of all, let, let, let's start by, the, by saying that. I think that uh, uh, investing in our communities um, is one of the best investments that we make in the company. So you can think of, okay, you invest in product and then you can monetize on the product. This is this is good for business. It's no doubt. Now, the question is, uh, what are the tools and the things that you can do to support that? Um, and, and I think that one of the most important thing is to let people feel really good about what they're doing um, and Absolute Cares is is really like an amazing platform for our people globally to give back to communities and things that make sense to them and things that uh, really touches them. Uh, so in different countries, we do different things and we let the team kind of uh, uh, think about what's really important for them. This is the team's activities that we're doing these days. And I think that, uh, I think that if, uh, I, just, I just thought about it yesterday. Um, in order to be really, really creative um, and innovative, um, you need to be fearless uh, because fear is, is, is stopping you from, from, from doing great things. And, and the best way to be fearless is to be thankful uh, for your, what you have. And the best way to be really thankful is to give back to community um, and it goes back to you. It's, it's, it's kind of an amazing cycle. And also when you're doing that with your colleagues, it can be different teams, different departments, different offices, you're creating a bonding that you cannot replicate in the in, in work, in the day-to-day. -day. And I think that we're kind of doing something amazing for communities, that's one. But why it's good for business, it's amazing for business. So it's a win-win-win. It's, 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 it's an amazing thing that we discovered in the last couple of years, we've been investing in the last year. And I think that COVID-19 was an amazing year to double down on that. And we doubled, we tripled uh, down on the apps like Care, dedicated this coronavirus uh, uh, fund that we, we, uh, uh, we usually don't do a, a, a money donation, but here we donated to universities, cross collaboration across uh, our nations um, uh, and stuff like that. Uh, with a lot of activities. Um, and I do recommend that everybody, every company will consider doing something, something like that. You cannot fix the world in one day, and this is not the intention. It's slowly, it's a slow process. Also, the, just the intention that uh, companies give into this, uh, if everybody will do it, uh, we will have a much better world in the future. Um, I, I am a strong believer in that, and this is this is great for business. So I think that business owners, boards, investors need to understand that this is great for business. Uh, the same way as diversity is diversity inclusion is great for business. Um, I think that in the boardrooms, CEOs, investors need to understand that this is also amazing for business. That's amazing, Aaron. And, and thank you for, for being so candid and, and sharing here. Um, as, as you know, or, or some of the guests know, I like to wrap this up with a, a 
a rapid fire question series. Are you ready for this? Let's do it. All right, Oren, what's your favorite day of the week? Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I live in Israel, and in Israel, we have a different week. Actually, you, you would say that Japan is kind of waking up the first uh, of the week, Monday morning. No, it's not. It's Israel, because we, we're waking up on Sunday morning to start our week. So our, our week starts Sunday to th Thursday, so I really like Sundays because we're kind of waking up uh, one day ahead of the entire world to get ready for the week. Uh, that's one day that I like. Uh, and also Thursday. Uh, I don't know why. It's been maybe for the weekend. Uh, although we have a weekend Friday and Saturday, but Friday is still working today globally. So you're kind of half working or some stuff, stuff like that. But yeah, Sunday and Thursday. What's the last book that you read? Atomic Habits. Uh, I was trying to uh, uh, build my habit and reading books. Uh, so I started with, uh, with Atomic Habits. I really recommend that. Uh, I think that one of the things that I started to do uh, after reading the book is uh, not charging my phone next in, my, in the bedroom. So when I'm going to sleep, I'm going to sleep. It's outside the room it's a good habit and are talking about the uh, phone what's your favorite asian cuisine <laughs> el thai chicken uh, green curry man and i and i miss oh, that yeah. i come i have to come visit you man yeah yes you do all right what's your favorite app ways for many reasons I'm, I'm i'm sure and and the last question uh a living business leader that you look up to um that's 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 an easy one for me although he passed away last month and for unfortunately that's tony shane um i think that tony shane had uh a really dramatic influence on me and the company and the way i'm thinking about customer and customer obsessed and customer centric and 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 i think that his uh delivering happiness book really influenced in so many aspects and on the business and on me um by far probably the most influential uh, leader that i had in the way i'm thinking about business unfortunately he passed away in a, a tragic uh, uh, incident last 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 month well for you tony shea is still living and with that thank you everybody for uh for joining the epicenter today and uh this wraps up season one <laughs> have a great week have a great weekend and everyone stay safe. Bye. Thank you, Ronan.